Continuing on from part one, we're going to take a look at homeostasis. Let me go ahead and uh, read the definition, then I'll explain it. So with homeostasis, we have values of variables which fluctuate around the set point to establish a normal range of values. Okay, so if we take a look here, we have our normal range. Right here, we have our set point. An example would be like, like a blood pressure or a body temperature or a blood sugar level or liver enzyme level, any of those things. We have a set point and then we have a normal range. If you go outside of that normal range, this is when there's problems and this is when disease can happen or illness or even death. And um, so we, we try to try to reach that set point, okay, um, as close to it as we can, but uh, there is some, some leeway here, okay? And some ranges are going to be very narrow, and if you go just a little bit outside of them, that can be a big problem. Some are going to have very wide ranges. Um, of uh, normal range and even if you go out of it a little bit usually it's not a problem okay and these things can change too depending on what's going on like a blood sugar level for instance a normal fasting blood sugar level uh, range normal range is going to be different than say you know after you've eaten something and it's even going to be different depending on what you've eaten Blood pressure, same thing. Uh, a normal blood pressure at rest is going to be different than normal blood pressure w during exercise. Okay? So, uh, think about a thermostat, for instance. Okay? When um, we have uh, a set point, you know, maybe you set the temperature to 72 degrees. Okay? Okay? When we start to go up above 72 degrees, then uh, the thermostat is going to um, kick on and tell the um, air conditioner to turn on, and it'll begin to cool. If it drops too far below 72 degrees, then it'll tell the furnace to kick on and warm it up. Okay, so... Basically, we have a few things that we have to look at uh, with homeostasis, and uh, we'll get into that in just a second. But let's talk about the different mechanisms of homeostasis. We have these feedback mechanisms. We have negative feedback, and if we have negative feedback, we must have what? We have positive feedback mechanisms. Negative feedback is a good example of that thermostat I was just talking about, where, again, if you go above um, your, your set range, then um, again, if you go above 72 degrees, you know, it's going to cool it down. If you go below 72 degrees, you're going to warm it up. Okay, so what's it say here? It says, uh, an increase in the variable is detected by a receptor. A control center responds um, to information from the receptor. The activity of an effector changes and a decrease in the variable is caused by the response of the effector so that we maintain homeostasis. And over here, decreased value, decrease in the variable is detected by a receptor. A control center responds to the information from the receptor the activity of the acceptor changes, effector, I'm sorry, um, changes, and an increase in the variable is caused by the response of the effector. What in the heck did that just say? Let's go back to the um, thermostat once again. Okay, the parts of your thermostat, we've, we've got the receptor. Okay, so with negative feedback, positive feedback, we have to have a receptor, okay? 
the receptor in your thermostat is going to be the thermometer. That's what's monitoring the external environment. So we have to have a receptor. Okay. Then we have to have a control center. Typically our control center is our brain. Okay, there are other control centers, but typically the control center is the brain. In the thermometer, or in the thermostat I should say, the thermostat itself is the control center. That's the brains. So the receptor, the thermometer, feeds information to the control center that makes a decision about what to do. Okay, and then we have an effector. Okay, and uh, an effector is what is going to make the change happen. Okay, in the thermostat, the effector is going to be your HVAC unit. In other words, your heating and air conditioning unit. Okay, um, let's talk about an example of negative feedback in a human and most feedback systems are going to be negative feedback systems. Um, since we're talking about temperature, let's talk about our temperature. If our body temperature starts to rise, maybe we're exercising or it's very hot out, um, our receptors, our heat and cold receptors are going to detect that, relay that information to the control center and a few things happen. Uh, blood vessels will dilate, okay, to allow for some of that uh, excess heat to dissipate from the skin. And we're going to sweat. So there's, there's a couple of different um, effector organs right there. The blood vessels are one of the effector organs and the sweat glands are the other effector organ, okay. So we had our receptor, the control center, told the effector there's a problem. The effector does its job. Now, why is it called a negative feedback system? And that's because once we reach a certain desired level, then we st stop it. Okay. The, the effector stops doing what it's doing. Um, uh, for instance, well, talking about temperature again, if our temperature raises, we begin to sweat. Now we cool down uh, to normal or maybe even a little bit below normal. Then we stop sweating. Okay, so there's the negative feedback. Um, think of hormones, for instance. We have to maintain a certain level of hormones. Okay, and... Um, when those hormones begin to drop, receptors detect that, and the effector organ, in other words, whatever organ is making that particular hormone, is going to start putting more of it into the bloodstream until that, that level of hormones raises to a certain point, whatever that normal point for that hormone is, and then it gets a signal to stop. We've, we've got enough, okay? Uh, again, talking about the thermostat, you know, we set the thermostat to 72 degrees. Um, you know, the temperature rises, uh, the air conditioner comes on and starts cooling it. Now, when it reaches that 72 degrees, um, then the control center tells the effector to stop, tells the, the thermostat, tells the air conditioner to shut off. Okay. So that's a negative feedback. And again, these feedback mechanisms are help to help maintain homeostasis. Now, positive feedback is, is different. Um, when a deviation occurs, responses to make the deviation greater and it leads away from homeostasis and it can even result in death. Okay, so there's a couple of examples here uh, for positive feedback. And one of them is uh, blood clotting. Okay, so with blood clotting, um, like for instance, uh, platelets, for instance, when you have a cut, uh, platelets will stick to the cut. 
okay, to try to block it off. Well, they're going to release chemicals, thromboxane, uh, but we'll just say chemicals for now. Uh, they'll release chemicals uh, that make other platelets sticky, and now they stick, and now there's more platelets, which are releasing more of that chemical to make other platelets sticky, and so on. So that's a positive feedback. Another one is childbirth. You have a contraction that leads to a stronger contraction that leads to a stronger contraction until finally the, the baby is delivered, the placenta is delivered, and that stimulus on the uterus has been taken away and that positive feedback stops. So one stimulus builds on the next stimulus. An example of where this can lead to death, there's a condition called DIC, disseminated intervascular coagulation. And what happens is during maybe trauma or maybe a very complicated surgery, and where there's a lot of bleeding, then the body overreacts. And it sends a lot of the clotting factors and platelets to the area in order to try to stop this bleeding. Well, if it overreacts and sends all of its clotting factors and all of its platelets to the area, now all of a sudden you run out of those platelets and the clotting factors. And then what happens is you bleed out internally. Um, this actually happened to my mother-in-law where she um, had open heart surgery. Everything went fine until the very end um, where they took her off the heart-lung machine and um, uh, she had gone into DIC. And um, uh, basically they could not get the bleeding to stop. What they hadn't realized was um, they had talked her into having a bypass surgery while she was still pretty strong and before she actually had a heart attack. Well, what they didn't realize is she had had a heart attack and the heart muscle um, tissue was, uh, of course, damaged you know, from the heart attack and the bleeding would not stop in that tissue. Uh, her body overreacted and she, she bled out basically. And so that's, that's an example of where this positive feedback mechanism can go awry and lead to death. Okay, let's look at terminology and body plan. This is the GPS, the map of the body. If you're trying to give directions on the body, then you're going to need to know these anatomical terms. Now, first of all, we have to have a starting point. Doesn't matter what position your patient or your cadaver or what have you is in, you always have to keep in mind anatomical position. So you have to visualize that patient in anatomical position, okay? And um, right here, this person is standing in anatomical position. The body is erect, they are facing forward, the feet are together, the palms are facing forward. That's anatomical position. So again, your cadaver or your patient can be all bent up and twisted and arms bent and looking sideways. But in order to utilize these terms, you want to picture that patient in this, pos this uh, specific position. Okay, so some of the body positions. Supine is laying face upward. Now, how I remember this is if you are supine, you are lying on your spine. So in other words, you're lying on your back looking up. Okay, so remember that. If you're supine, you're lying on your spine. If you're prone, you're lying face downward. How I think of that is if you're laying face downward, you may not see someone sneak up on you and you're prone to getting attacked or prone to somebody stomping on you. Okay, so that's how I remember supine and prone. Other directional terms. 
superior versus inferior. Superior means above, inferior means below. So what is my nose, superior or inferior? Okay, well the question you should have asked is to what? Okay, so these terms here, uh, we have to compare it to something else. So if I say um, my nose is superior to my mouth, that means my nose is above my mouth. So my mouth would be what to my nose? My mouth would be inferior uh, to my nose. Okay. Another term that we can use for superior and inferior is cephalic and caudal. Uh, cephalic means toward the head. Cephalad means head. So if it's toward the head, we can say, oh yeah, that's cephalic to whatever point we're talking about. If it's inferior, uh, we can also say it is caudal. Caudal means tail, but uh, we can say it's caudal. Okay. Now, superior and cephalic are the same. And inferior and caudal are the same, but only in humans. And the reason I say that is because in humans, we're bipedal. That means we stand on two feet and we stand upright. Okay. If we're looking at a four-legged critter, superior would not be uh, cephalic. Okay. Because if we go up, you know, superiorly on, say, a dog... Well, that's going to be his back or the, so, you know, that's not the same. So forget all that right now. Uh, since we're studying humans, you want to get it right for humans. So superior and cephalic are the same in humans. Inferior and caudal are the same in humans. Okay. And then uh, anterior versus posterior. And we have another name for that as well. Another name for anterior is ventral. Ventral means belly. So anterior and ventral mean in front. And then posterior, which means behind, another term for that is dorsal. Okay. Think of the dorsal fin on a shark. It's on his back. Okay. So just to confuse you a little bit, but then we'll get away from it. On a four-legged critter, um, remember I said if you look superior on a dog, that's going to be his back. So you're scratching his back. What's another name for back? What's on the back of a shark? Dorsal, right? So on a four-legged cr critter, uh, superior and dorsal are the same. Inferior and ventral are the same because inferior to his back is going to be his belly and ventral means belly. Okay. All right. So going back to humans though, um, anterior and ventral are the same. Posterior and dorsal are the same. So let's go back to my nose again. My nose is what to my ear. And if you put your finger on your nose and another finger on your ear, you'll notice that your nose is in front of your ear. So you're going to say, okay, my nose is in front, so my nose is anterior to my ear. My ear is posterior to my nose. The best way to do this on a test, okay, and to get this straight in your head, is to first say the, the normal uh, words for it. Okay, the everyday words for it. So, again, my nose is in front of my uh, ear. So I would say that first. Well, which term says in front of? Okay, well, that's going to be anterior. So my nose is anterior to my ear. My ear is in back of my nose, right? Well, what's the word we use for in back of or back? Well, that would be posterior or dorsal. 
Um, well, for now, we're just going to use anterior and posterior. So my ear is posterior to my nose. Okay. Now medial and lateral. If you look here, she has a line running down the center of her, and anything toward that midline is going to be medial. Okay, like the median in a road is down the middle of the road. So medial is toward the midline. Lateral is away from that middle line. Let's go back to your nose and ear again. So my nose is more toward the midline than my ear is. So my nose is medial to my ear. My ear is more away from the midline than my nose is, so my ear is lateral to my nose. Okay, does that make sense? So say the, the everyday word for it first, my ear is away from the midline compared to my nose. Away from the midline is lateral. Okay, but wait a second, I thought we said it was anterior and posterior. Well, we can combine these terms to be more accurate. So for instance, we know that my nose is anterior compared to my ear. We know that it's medial uh, compared to my ear. So we can say that the nose is anterior medial to my ear. And we can say that the ear is posterior lateral compared to my nose. Okay, so this is just a, a little more uh, detailed way of describing something. Okay. Uh, now, proximal versus distal. For us, for right now, we're only going to use this example when we're talking about arms and legs. Okay. Can this, this be used otherwise? Yes, typically when we're talking about internal organs, we can use the term proximal and distal. But until you really understand it, um, and for using the surface anatomy that we're looking at now, we're only going to use proximal and distal with the arms and legs. Okay, so any test question that comes up about arms and legs, um, think about proximal and distal. Okay, so distal, of course, that means off in the distance. So it's going to be farther away from the trunk. Uh, proximal means closer to the trunk. Okay, so in other words, this is where, you know, the arm attaches. This is where the leg attaches. Okay, so uh, let's look at an arm, for instance. Okay, compare your fingers to the elbow. Okay, if the... Um, fingers are going to be farther away from the elbow. They're more in the distance. So we're going to say that the fingers are distal to the elbow. Okay. Um, what is the elbow compared to the shoulder? Well, the elbow is farther away. In other words, in the distance um, from where it attaches um, to the shoulder. So your elbow is distal to your shoulder. Well, what's your shoulder compared to your elbow? Well, the shoulder is closer to the attachment of the body than the elbow. So the shoulder is proximal um, to the body compared to the elbow. And if we look at the fingertips compared to the elbow, so the elbow is proximal um, from the uh, fingertips. Okay, so I hope that makes sense. Distal means off in the distance. Fingertips are more in the distance than the elbow, so the fingers are distal to the elbow. The elbow is closer to the body than the fingers, so the elbow is proximal to the fingers. The shoulder is proximal to the elbow. The knee is going to be distal from the hip. The hip is proximal to the knee. Uh, the foot 
is distal from the knee, the knee is proximal to the foot. Okay, so I hope that helps. Um, it's a little bit confusing, but again, just use the proximal and distal for arms and legs. Superficial versus deep. Okay, my superficial means toward the surface. Deep, of course, means deep to that. Okay, underneath it. So my skin is what to my bones? It's superficial. My bones are what to my skin? They're deep. Okay, so I hope you didn't have a problem with that. Looking at body parts and regions. Um, the head, which again we say is cephalic, or we could talk about the skull, which is cranium. If something is going toward the skull, we say it's cranial. Okay. So forehead is frontal. We actually have a bone right here that's called the frontal bone. The eye is round, round like the earth. What do satellites do around the earth? What does the moon do around the earth? It orbits it. So the eye is orbital. The nose is nasal. The mouth is is oral. The ear. Now stop for a second. If you have a watch, you know, that you wind up, um, probably not. Most people don't. Mine still does this. But if I put my watch up to my ear, oh, tick. I hear my watch ticking. So that's what you want to think about. Listening to a watch ticking and going, oh, tick. So, oh, tick is ear. Buccal is cheek. Now, I've also heard it pronounced buckle as well. Um, I've always learned it as buccal, so I'm just sticking with buccal. But buckle is an acceptable uh, pronunciation of it as well. They're pointing to the wrong cheek, though. They're pointing to his cheekbone. That is not buccal. Let me just pull up, if I can here, if this will work. There we go. Um... It's going from this cheek right here. Okay. So this is really buccal. So it's the soft part of your cheek, not your cheek bones. So whoever put this together messed up when they drew that line. Okay. Now the chin is going to be uh, mental. And let me just go back and get my pointer again. There we go. So the chin is mental, okay? Like if you're using your mental faculties and you're over there scratching your chin, hmm, okay? So that is mental. The neck is cervical. If we look at the trunk now, we have um, the thorax or uh, thoracic cage. And of course the thorax was made uh, Famous by that Dr. Seuss movie that wait a second, somebody's saying something to me. It's not it's not Thorax. The movie's Lorax. Oh. Okay, forget it. Um but they did make a a park that's very famous. I'm sure you've heard of the park. It's Thoracic Park. What? There there's no Jurassic Oh. Okay. Skip that too. Never mind. All right, so thoracic is going to refer to kind of the rib cage area. And so chest is going to be pectoral. And this is the pectoralis major. The breastbone is sternal because we have the sternum underneath there. The breast is mammary. And then if we look at the abdominal pelvic region here, we have the abdomen which is abdominal the navel which is umbilical the pelvis is pelvic and then right in the crease here we have uh, the groin area which is inguinal and then the genital region is pubic and you can follow the arrow yourself all right and if we come over here we have the collarbone, which is clavicular. We have the armpit, 
which is axillary. Then we have the shoulder. The arm is brachial. The elbow is cubital. And actually in the front of the elbow here, like this, this is actually what we call the antecubital fossa. Um, and then the forearm is antebrachial. Okay, so we have brachial, antebrachial, cubital. Okay. So that's part of the upper limb as well as the hand. The hand is manual. The wrist is carpal. The palm is palmar. Fingers are going to be digital. The hip is coxal. The thigh is femoral, because we have a, a femur in there. That's the bone. The kneecap is patellar. And then if somebody comes over and kicks you in the shin, oh man, that would just be cruel. Okay, so leg is cruel. Okay, little different spelling there, but hopefully that'll help you remember. And then the ankle is, well, the ankle. The top of the foot is the dorsum, and your toes are also digital. Okay, did I mention fingers are digital? Um, and, of course, those make up the foot, and another term for foot is pedal. Okay, for instance, uh, if you get on a bicycle, you put your foot on the pedal, okay? Well, this is anatomy. We're going to pronounce it a little bit different. We'll pronounce it as pedal. Okay, sir, turn around, please. Thank you. All right, the base of the skull is occipital. And we have a skull bone back there, too, called the occipital bone. And the back of the neck is nuchal. Okay, matter of fact, we have a ligament called the ligamentum nuchae, which attaches from your, your cervical vertebrae here to the base of your skull, and it helps support the neck. Okay, so back of the neck is nuchal. This guy's a nuchal head. Oh, I'm sorry, nuchal is neck. Never mind. Um, going back to the trunk again, we have the back is dorsal. And so on the back, we're going to have the shoulder blades, which are scapular. We have the vertebral column, which is a vertebral. And then we have the loin, which is lumbar. And see, when I had my practice, if somebody came with a sore back, I would, you know, kind of poke around and, you know, push and everything. And maybe it was sore right here. And so what would I put in my, in my notes if they had uh, a sore lumbar? I would say patient presents with tender loins. Okay, bad joke. Anyway, skip that. Um, between the hips is sacral, so it's the triangular area here, which is the sacrum. The buttock is gluteal, and the perineum is perineal. What in the world is perineal? Okay, um, think about you're taking a shower, okay, you want to dry off really good, so you kind of step over the towel and do this little floss motion right there um, okay you just dried your perineum okay it's that area kind of in between the front and the back there okay that's that's probably a visual none of us needed but anyway that would be the perineum and for the upper limb we have the point of the shoulder and you can kind of feel it on your own shoulder there is a pointy thing sticking out up there and that's the acromion we're going to see the acromion because it is part of the scapula. So when we get to the skeletal system, we'll see that little thing that sticks out. Okay, you ever hit your elbow, you know, you just kind of smack it good. And then you're like, oh, lecranon. Okay, well, that's the point of your elbow. So do that. Smack your elbow. And now go, oh, lecranon. Okay, you didn't do it. I know this is only video. Try it again. So you smack your elbow and you say, oh, 
Lecranon. Okay, good job. So that's how you're going to remember that the point of your elbow is the olecranon. When we get to the skeletal system, we will see that the ulna has an olecranon process. And again, that's, that's what makes the point of your elbow. The back of the hand is dorsum. Again, dorsal means back, right? So back of the hand, dorsum. Lower limbs here. The hollowed area behind the knee. Now, if you're like me and you try to bend your knees, sometimes they pop. So that's how you remember that the back of the knee is the popliteal or popliteal, however you'd like to pronounce that, uh, region. Okay. <clears throat> and then uh, calf is sural. How I kind of remember that is I remember one time uh, visiting someone, uh, they had a baby calf that, that got out of the yard, okay, and we were trying to, like, you know, chase it back into the yard, and I'll tell you, a calf doesn't seem like much until it's running at you, okay, again, they may not seem like much, but, you know, imagine a Volkswagen running at you. Okay, I think you'd want to get out of the way, right? Well, I swore the ground was shaking while this thing was running toward me. And, of course, give it a, a scream and wave in my hands, you know. Probably more out of fear than trying to chase it back into the yard. But it turned, went into the yard, and they put the, the fence back up and everything. Um, well, I just remember after that thinking, you know, next time I have to do any work with uh, calves, Okay, I'm going to need some energy. I need some more energy. So I'm going to have to have myself a good breakfast. And you know what I'm going to have? A big bowl of sorrel. Okay? So you got that? So if you're going to be out there roping calves, then you better have yourself a big bowl of sorrel. Okay, so that's how you can remember that the calf is sorrel. All right? All right, and then the sole of your foot is plantar. You're going to plant your foot down, okay? So plantar. And the heel is calcaneal. And now looking at body planes, and this is how we're going to slice a body up, and why would you do that? Well, you would make these different cuts as incisions, possibly. You can make these cuts on cadavers to slice the cadavers up to see what you're looking at. Um, but uh, probably more common uh, that you're going to see is like MRIs and CT scans. They will slice up the body in these different uh, positions. So the first one here is we have a sagittal section. A sagittal goes right down the middle. I wish he was facing forward, but uh, it would be right down the midline, and it would give you a right and a left half. Okay, so that's sagittal. Also, if it's right down in the middle, we call it a mid-sagittal section or a median section. But we can have it uh, a cut like that off center and off to the side of the center. And um, who's that? that uh, person that uh, works for an attorney you know they do all the work the attorney gets all the money and uh, I shouldn't say that I'll get in trouble for that but um, basically they help the attorneys out it's a paralegal para means alongside of so the paralegal works alongside the lawyer a paramedic works alongside the physician okay the medic um, so what kind of section are we going to have if uh, we're off that midline, that median plane? We're going to have a parasagittal section. Okay. Now if we slice kind of running down through the head uh, and we slice it so that there's a front and a back, we call that frontal. Okay. Now, I say head, but I mean, this goes all the way down through the body, okay? And so that is going to be a frontal section. We also call it a coronal section. So it's it's like a crown, okay? That's what coronal means. 
And um, kind of sounds familiar, right? Like the coronavirus, okay? Um, the reason it's called the coronavirus is because it looks like it has a, a crown on it. Um, let's see, transverse section is going to be a slice where you're going to get a top and a bottom. Okay, and again, the slice can be everywhere from starting at the top of the head, working all the way down, you know, to the, to the feet. And um, again, that gives you a top and bottom. So let's review that a little bit. A sagittal section is going to give a right and a left. Mid sagittal or median section is right in the middle. So you have equal right and left. Parasagittal is off of center, and you're going to have unequal right and left. So you're going to have a wing and a thigh and a wing and a thigh on each side. Okay. Uh, a frontal or coronal section is going to give you a front and a back. A transverse section or cross section is going to give you a top and a bottom. And again, they don't have to be equal. Um, and then an oblique section is on an angle, so it's other than a right angle, so it's going to be kind of a diagonal, okay? Okay, body cavities. Looking at the body cavities, um, I'm going to go to a different uh, section in a second, but we have the thoracic cavity, and then we have the abdominopelvic cavity. Okay, and you can see here that the abdominal pelvic cavity is made up of the abdominal cavity. And if we go from the top of the sacrum to the top of the pubic bone, anything below that is going to be in the pelvic cavity. Up top here we have the thoracic cavity, and what separates it is the diaphragm. I like this um, a little bit better, this view because we have a ventral cavity and a dorsal cavity. Now in the ventral cavity, and, I, and in class I, I usually do this as a flow chart, and so you might want to write this as a flow chart. So if you do a flow chart, put ventral cavity and then dorsal cavity. Under ventral cavity, the next line that would come off of that would be thoracic cavity. Okay, so thoracic cavity. Um, and then off of the thoracic cavity, and I'm going to go back to the anterior view here. In the thoracic cavity, we're going to have the pleural cavities. And that's where the lungs are. So the pleural cavities. How do I remember that? Well, how many hearts do we have? Oh, we have one heart. How many lungs? Oh, lungs, two, because we have an S at the end to make it what? Plural. That's how I remember it. So we have uh, the pleural cavities. And then in the center, we have the mediastinum. Okay, the mediastinum. And so there's a lot going on in the mediastinum. Now some books will talk about the cardiac cavity. Okay, well the cardiac cavity is really um, within the mediastinum. Okay, it's the cavity that holds the heart. But again, that's, that's really in the mediastinum. It's the anterior portion of the mediastinum. So again, if you're going to do your your um, your little flow chart, you have um, ventral cavity. Your first line coming off of it is going to be thoracic cavity, and then the thoracic cavity is going to be divided up into the pleural cavities and the mediastinum, and then you could have a line coming off the mediastinum, and say that that is the pericardial cavity because the heart is within the the pericardium the sac that surrounds the heart 
So that's another term that could be used. Okay. And our next line coming off the ventral cavity is going to be the abdominal pelvic cavity. And the abdominal pelvic cavity is divided up into the abdominal cavity and the pelvic cavity. The abdominal cavity is going to contain uh, a lot of your digestive organs, your liver, your intestines, your stomach, things like that. The pelvic cavity will have uh, some um, intestine in there as well, but it'll also have digestive, or not digestive, but reproductive organs, such as uh, uterus, for instance, and uh, also urinary bladder will be found down in the pelvic cavity. So then we come back to our dorsal cavity, okay? And the first thing that would come off the dorsal cavity would be the cranial cavity, and of course that's where your brain lives. And then we would have the vertebral cavity after that. Okay, and that's where the spinal cord lives. And now we're going to take a look at abdominal subdivisions. Now if we take a midline line and draw it through the belly button, draw another line horizontally through the belly button, it's going to give us four sections, so quadrants. And don't forget that this is going to be the patient's right and left, not your right and left. So it'll be opposite of you as long as you're facing the patient. If you're looking at the patient's back, your right and left and their right and left will be the same. Okay. Um, but uh, we're looking at them face on. And so we see the right upper quadrant. Again, this is the patient's right, the left upper quadrant, the right lower quadrant, and the left lower quadrant. Okay, and um, we can see a lot of the different organs that are found within each of these quadrants. Such as the right upper quadrant, we see most of the liver. We see some small intestine. We see some large intestine. Um, also, the gallbladder is right here. So sometimes a patient might come in holding that section and saying that after they eat something maybe, you know, high in fat, they might get some pain there. And also they might get some pain uh, referring into their shoulder and what have you. But we say that the patient complains of right upper quadrant pain. And why would that be? Because uh, the gallbladder holds bile, and bile is a substance that breaks fat up into tiny little particles that can be absorbed. Okay, so if you have stones in the gallbladder and it squeezes to squirt some of that bile into um, the small intestine and, um, and it's irritated, well, when you eat something fatty, it's going to squeeze to squirt that bile in um, but it's squeezing against stones. Um, take a handful of rocks and uh, squeeze them till your hands are sore and then squeeze them again and see how much uh, pain that is, you know, to squeeze against those, uh, that hard object. Okay, so it's going to be difficult. But anyway, we would describe that as the patient complains of right upper quadrant pain. Okay, right lower quadrant pain. What if somebody complains of right lower quadrant pain? Maybe referring over toward the belly button a little more. What do we see in the right lower quadrant? We see the appendix. So the patient might be suffering from appendicitis. Uh, if a patient has left upper quadrant pain, they might have a gastritis going on, an inflammation of their stomach, or they may have uh, something going on with their intestines. Okay, a lot of times it's just gas. Left lower quadrant pain, again, could be intestinal or could be gas. Matter of fact, gas can cause pain in all of these quadrants because the large intestine moves through all of those quadrants. Okay. 
Now, if we want to break this down even smaller and get a little more precise, then we can do kind of like a tic-tac-toe and create regions. So we'll start in the middle region here, and that's going to be the umbilical region. The belly button is going to be kind of in the center. Above that is the epigastric region. Epi means above. Like your epidermis is above your dermis. Uh, that's part of your skin. So the outermost layer of the skin is called the epidermis. So epi means above. Um, and gastric refers to the stomach. So it's the above the stomach region. Down below the umbilical region, we have the hypogastric region. Hypo means below. Okay. And then um, coming back here at the epigastric region to the right, we have the right hypochondriac region. And to the left, we have the left hypochondriac region. So what does that mean? We know hypo means below. But usually, if we think of a hypochondriac, we think of somebody that uh, thinks they're sick all the time or pretends that they're sick all the time. And, um, you know, they always think something's going on with them, you know, but probably not. Well, that's not the same meaning that we have here. Hypo means below. Chondro means ribs. What we don't see in this picture, uh, which I, I wish it was a little better picture, but uh, we would see uh, about right here would be the tip of the sternum. And then we would have the sternum coming up all the way up to here. Okay, and let me move the sternum up a little bit more. Maybe the tip of the sternum here. Here's the rest of the sternum. And off of that comes ribs. Well, your ribs don't go all the way up to your sternum. They come up partially, and then the rest of the way is cartilage. Okay, and that's what this is talking about. This area right here, which looks like your liver is up into your rib cage here, well, it is. It is pushed up under the rib cage a little bit. Okay, and so hypochondriac means below the cartilage. And it's that cartilage that makes up uh, part of the rib cage. Same thing on this side. Again, we have cartilage. And so that's going to be the hypochondriac region. Okay. And then we have the right and left lumbar region. And, you know, you might know that your lumbar, we typically think of it as your low back. And this is in the low back region because remember these these divisions go three-dimensional. Okay, so this goes all the way to the back. All right, and then um, on either side of the hypogastric region, we're going to have the right and left iliac region. It's called iliac because the bone right here, the hip bone, is called the ilium. But there's another name that we can put here as well. Remember that little crease here? That's called the inguinal, um, inguinal region here. So we can call it right and left inguinal region. And now let's take a look at the serous membranes. Serous membranes cover the organs of trunk cavities and also line them. Now, uh, typically what these look like is a sac or in this case like a balloon turned inside out on itself and so you're going to have two layers you're going to have a, a parietal layer which is the outermost layer think of perimeter so perimeter parietal so here's your parietal serous membrane and then you're going to have a, a visceral uh, layer and viscera means organ. In this case, the organ is the fist. And so what's actually touching the fist is going to be the visceral serous membrane. And then there's going to be a cavity, somewhat. It's not going to be as large as this. Typically, the two membranes uh, come together 
and almost touch except that there's a fluid in there and that's what keeps them from actually touching but uh, it's serous fluid and it lubricates the membranes the function of serous membranes basically to prevent friction and to allow the organ uh, to move okay and and again that's the function of the serous fluid too is to make those two membranes even slipperier okay and so we're going to have specific names for these serous membranes like the pericardium refers to the heart the pleural membranes remember we said talked about the pleural cavities what's found there the lungs so the pleura refers to the lungs and uh, thoracic cavity so the membranes that surround the lung and surround the thoracic cavity and then the peritoneum refers to the abdominal pelvic cavity membranes and um, typically if we see inflammation of the membranes what's the suffix that we use in other words what do we put at the end of a word to indicate inflammation that would be itis so if someone has inflammation of the pericardium we call that pericarditis if they maybe your appendix ruptures okay and uh, spills bacteria and everything into your abdominal cavity then you can develop peritonitis now with the pleura that's a little trickier we can call it pleuritis um, or there's another term too that's called pleurisy okay so with pleuritis or pleurisy you know it's not a big deal it only hurts if you breathe and it only feels like somebody standing there with an ice pick and every time you take in a breath they like shove it in between your ribs okay so why is that it's because the pleura have they swell up and this goes along with the others too uh, but the pleura swells up and um, when you take in a breath you know those membranes again uh, rub on each other as your lungs expand um, well if they're swollen and if there's not much fluid or the fluids kind of thick and sticky then it's going to be very painful and very difficult um, to breathe and this shows kind of a side view of the different membranes we have the parietal peritoneum and the visceral peritoneum so the parietal is going to be in in blue uh, red is going to be the visceral and then we have some other structures that are called mesenteries that's part of the peritoneum um, we have the mesenteries which hold the large and the small intestines together actually usually we refer to what holds the small intestines together as mesenteries the mesentery that holds the large intestines together we call that the mesocolon and then we have this little loop here that we would call the greater omentum okay it's like a little apron that hangs down okay now have you ever been to one of these restaurants that looks like it's out of the 1950s or the 1960s well we would call that retro right that design is kind of retro because it's it's behind the times okay well we can have organs that are retro peritoneal which means they're behind the peritoneum so some examples would be like the kidneys um, the duodenum which is the first part of the small intestine that comes off the stomach um, the rectum down here the urinary bladder um, what else the uterus uh, those would be examples of retroperitoneal organs medical imaging clinical focus so an x-ray or a radiograph is a shadowy negative of internal body structures so what you have is a, a piece of film 
and and now that's even replaced uh, with digital. But uh, in the past, you would have a piece of film that had emulsion on each side. So it was basically, if you've ever used a camera that took film, uh, the film inside the camera, um, it has emulsion on one side that's light sensitive. So when the shutter opens up, light hits it and exposes it, and then you develop it. In x-rays, there's emulsion on both sides of the film. Okay, the film typically looks like clear green piece of plastic until you expose it to light, and then it darkens it. So it's, it's basically black and white film is what it is. And you put it in this thing called a cassette, and the cassette has these crystals on each side of the cassette that light up when x-rays hit them. So instead of using actual light to expose the, the um, film, and instead of using the actual x-rays themselves to expose the film, we're actually relying on the light that's produced by these crystals when they light up when the x-ray hits it. We call them rare earth crystals. Okay, and um, the rare earth crystals of nowadays, you know, that they use really, really light up bright with low amounts of radiation. So that's why it doesn't take much uh, radiation anymore to take an x-ray. You get more radiation flying in an airplane than you do from getting a chest x-ray. So I think uh, it's flying in a plane is is equivalent to I believe like several hundred chest x-rays um, so we're using very minimal radiation at this point but x-ray is what we would call ionizing radiation okay and um, it can cause damage to your DNA and especially over time ionizing radiation you have a lifetime limit of how much of that radiation that you can receive and it's cumulative throughout your life okay uh, but um, anyway nowadays I, I think we still use the I, and I'm not sure don't quote me on this I quit practice um, about the time this came out so uh, but I think we still use um, the screens that light up but instead of film yeah, it's uh, receptors in there that capture the the light image just like you have in a digital camera and you take that cassette instead of going into a dark room like we did in the old days and open up the cassette in the dark room and then uh, develop the the film um, now you just take that cassette plug it into a USB into your computer and it downloads the image so where was that when I was in practice? That would have been so much easier. Um, let's see, CT or commuted, uh, computed uh, tomography, uh, what we used to call a CAT scan. CAT st stood for computerized axial tomography. Uh, I guess that was too big of a word, so we abbreviated it to CT scan, computed tomography. It's a, a refined version of x-ray, and it slices the body. Now, here you're going to get a lot more ionizing radiation because you were taking lots of x-rays, and um, those images go into a computer where they're put together. Um, but you can develop, or, or I should say um, receive, quite a bit of uh, radiation this way. And if you get a lot of CT scans, um, you can pretty much max out your lifetime limit pretty quickly of uh, how much radiation exposure you should have. Um, but um, it's very useful. Um, I remember when CTs came out, and it was long before MRIs came out. Now, since CTs are X-rays, and I didn't mention this with X-ray, but X-ray works best on calcified tissue. So bone is calcified tissue. If you have 
some kind of um, arthritic thing going on that's calcified. Sometimes lesions, uh, like in the lungs, for instance, might calcify. And these things show up rather well on x-ray. Everything else shows up as kind of, you know, shades of gray. And this is why, like, if they're going to do an x-ray of your esophagus and stomach, an upper GI, you would drink a contrast material. Or they would inject a contrast material into your blood vessels and take an x-ray to see what the blood vessels look like. Uh, CT, um, same thing. Um, you're going to be able to see the organs a bit better than with regular x-ray. But soft tissue is not going to look as good as it would on MRI. MRI works best on soft tissue, and I'll tell you why in a little bit here. But in the day, CTs were great. You know, we'd use them to look at the brain. We'd use it to look for, you know, lesions and other parts of the organs and everything as well. It's just that it works better in... Uh, you know, for bony or calcified situations. Okay, DSR, or dynamic spatial reconstruction, is three-dimensional imaging and allows for movement. DSA, or digital subtraction, and geography, is comparison of radiographs with and without dye used often in blood vessel studies. Now, all of those I just mentioned um, the X-ray, the CT, DSR, DSA are all ionizing radiation. Okay, they all use X-rays. Sonography, or ultrasound, is inexpensive and safer than ionizing radiation because you're using sound waves. Okay, I like to fish. I have a fish finder uh, for my boat. And it is the same thing. It is sonography, basically. Um, it's ultrasound. What it does is it sends a little ping through the water, this little sound ping, and as that sound hits hard things, it reflects back up and is picked up um, by the transducer of the um, fish finder. Okay, Things that are soft absorb a lot of that sound, you know, so not much of it gets reflected back, so that shows up in shades of gray, or if you have a nice color um, color one, it'll show up as a different color. Okay, and so with that, I can also see, you know, how deep the mud is uh, in the lake and where, you know, the, the bedrock is, you know, uh, with that. Uh, and I can also see little curves, which are fish and little outlines of things that are like shrubs and things like that. Well, it's the same principle. We send out um, a sound wave, and when that sound wave hits something, it bounces back, and depending on the density of the tissue, it's going to give you a sharper or, or less sharp image, depending on that tissue. And it can construct that image now into a three-dimensional image. Matter of fact, for fishing, um, those um, fish finders now, um, some of them will do a three-dimensional view of what's underwater. And you've probably seen some of the sonograms, you know, for the babies, uh, where it's, you can see the baby three-dimensionally. Uh, before uh, they had the three-dimensional, you know, it was kind of odd, you know, what the baby looked like. You couldn't tell if you were having a boy, a girl, or a turtle. Um, so it was a lot more difficult to read those. Now you get a little better view of the external um, view of the infant, um, as well as, you know, with the traditional ultrasound, you can also see some of the internal organs as well as the heart beating and such. Okay, then MRI, or magnetic resonance imaging, again, that's not ionizing radiation, it's using magnetic energy. Produces a high contrast image of soft tissue. So 
Like, for instance, if you think you have a torn meniscus in your knee, what's better, CT or MRI? Well, it'd be MRI because a meniscus is soft tissue. If you think you chipped a bone in your knee, well, then a CT would be better because that looks like bony um, images. Uh, what the MRI does is, uh, again, we it works on water, basically. Okay, hydrogen ions. And um, what are we made up mostly of? And that's water, and that would be our soft tissues. And so that's why the MRI is so much better for soft tissue. But uh, we put you in the machine. It basically, the magnet will take those those water molecules basically um, it'll put all the north poles north and all the south poles south and then when the machine shuts off all that energy that was absorbed all of a sudden those molecules spin back to their original position and you emit that energy back out again and that's picked up um, again by the by the machine goes into a computer and it turns it into an image. Of course, it's a lot more detailed than that, um, but it is interesting how the MRI works. And then we have the PET scan or positive emission tomography scan. It's used to study active cells. Typically a radioisotope is injected um, and this has some radioactivity to it. And then a scan will um, come over and look at areas uh, where there's a high uptake of this radioisotope, that means it's a more active um, tissue. For instance, if they're doing a brain study, the areas of the brain that are working, whenever they like show you something or tell you something, it'll show up, you know, much uh, more concentrated or brighter. Computers will also take this and put color to it. So more active would show up more red inactive tissue would show up more blue okay obviously if there was uh, a tumor going on especially an aggressive tumor it might show up very red and um, you know other tissue would show up again kind of in between that red and blue depending on how active that tissue is okay and that concludes our introductory lecture